uh, it was about six weeks into sixth form, uh, the, my teacher, uh, a man called Ian McGregor, who managed to transform my life, great guy, came up to me and said, um, I don't think he'd have called me Stephen, he probably called me Perry. That's the way they talk to each other in public schools, which I went to. Um, could I ask you something? Of course, sir. Um, he said, what are you interested in? Uh, he'd obviously found it difficult to communicate with me. And I said, um, football? He said, yes, I, I, I know that. Um, China? I, he said, yes, I, I know a little bit about your dad's work there. And uh, also um, Marxism. And he looked at me and he thought, this is rather uh, uninteresting pupil, what would he possibly know about Marxism? And uh, so he asked me a couple of questions and realised I didn't know a thing or two. And then he said to me, I wonder if you could hold on a second. And he went off and he came back and he gave me a book. And he said, I wonder if you could read this for me and tell me what you think of it. It was a book written by, goodness me, I can't remember the name, a very famous English historian and expert on literature. <coughs> it was a book about the winter's tale. And whether it was an early, um, took the form of the, um, of the concept of the... Um, the dialectic, whether it was an early form of the dialectic, way before Marx considered it. Well, I got the book back to him the next morning with my comments on the book, and he said, I wonder if uh, it's possible that you could um, write that up to me in a sort of note or essay form, because I've got to make a speech on it tonight, it would be tremendously helpful if I could use what you've just said. That was my first essay on English literature. <laughs> He's a very clever man, he managed to get me engaged and get me involved. And uh, he taught me that the skill of the teacher was to get the pupil involved. And uh, what an incredible opportunity I then had to learn about literature and culture through the window of William Shakespeare. So as my father and Sam were talking about trying to uh, build some tribute to Shakespeare in the South Bank, um, I began to wake up. And uh, that was the beginning for me of about 40 years of working with Sam on uh, getting this, the Globe Theatre built. And that involved um, transforming the, uh, the power station into the Tate. That involved his idea of building a, a, a walking bridge across uh, the Thames. He was an incredibly imaginative man. And you see the Globe Theatre today. It's a wonderful expression of what people could do with ideas. So the South Bank University for me has a lot of... Uh, interesting associations and uh, and I think here of, of what a terrible state this whole area got into when the docks moved it really was very run down and if it hadn't been for Sam I don't think any of this would have transformed I've got some interesting stories there about some of the fights we had with the Labour Council at the time anyway moving on <coughs> talking about China more specifically is to talk about how my father uh, became involved because that's how I became involved um, China, from the early 19th century until 1949, was taken to pieces. And the China that uh, was created in 1949 was um, absolutely um, stricken by poverty. I think the average life expectancy was 27. There was disease everywhere, um, drug addiction, prostitution. It was a terrible country in a terrible state. And uh, China, from those terrible beginnings, over the next uh, 15, 20 years, uh, stood up, I think Chairman Mao said, and got itself organized, <coughs> protected its borders, and the people began to move out of absolute uh, terrible conditions into a, a more stable situation. And then along came the idea of a great leap forward. And, um, well, I'll come to that again in, in, in a moment. I, I, I want to take you to a period of about 1951 with Zhou Enlai and the other leaders in China thinking that what they had to do was import a lot of goods to help transform the country and in order to do that they had to export, uh, that's the time of the Korean War, of sanctions on China, all sorts of things and they had to try and find ways to reopen <coughs> their trade routes. What they, uh, what they did was they sent out Zhou Enlai's uh, chief of staff, a man called Chi Chi <coughs> to Europe to try and find somebody to help reopen the trade links. He, um, he went to Cambridge because they had some contacts with Joseph Needham 
they'd had contacts with Joe Robinson, who was one of the professors of economics who helped Keynes, and they asked any ideas that he might have. They arranged a dinner party with my father. He was, uh, my father was raised in the East End of London, left school when he was 14, but was very well self-educated. And my father was very chuffed to be invited to Cambridge to dinner. And he sat down and enjoyed dinner with uh, this uh, Chinese gentleman who spoke with a wonderful American accent. My father never for a moment thought he came from China. He thought he'd come from the United States. About two weeks later, Chi Chao Ching called him and said, I'd like to talk to you. Would you come to Bern to meet me? And my father said, well, I've only ever been out of England twice. Um, and the uh, second time was for my honeymoon. Uh, of course, I'll come and visit you because I'd love to, love to do so. My father went to Bern, and that's where Chi Chao Ching introduced who he was and what his mission was, and said, I enjoyed meeting you over dinner, and your friends and colleagues say, you are a man who can help us transform and uh, get China's foreign trade started. My father said, I'm a textile merchant. I have no idea about international trade. I don't know why you think I can help you. And Chi Chao Ching said to him, well, we don't know much more than you either. But if you think uh, our mission might work, then together we will make this happen. And it was in those sorts of contexts that my father made the decision to give up his share of the textile business and start London Export Corporation uh, and start the business of trading with China. The first deals were in wool tops and it took a long time to get the merchants in Yorkshire and Lancashire to agree to offer goods for China. Eventually one man, Parkinson, uh, took the brave decision to offer goods to China, wool tops for carpets and so on. And a deal was done and uh, they then had the problem about financing of it and my father said on the advice from the Chinese that they would open a letter of credit from the Bank of China and uh, that the, he and his banks wouldn't accept a Bank of China letter of credit and insisted that it be confirmed by a Western Bank. China then and now and ever since has stood on a point of principle. In the end, they accepted the Bank of China letter of credit and uh, the rest is history, the development of trade <coughs> not only Britain but throughout Europe and China. And uh, my father was a visionary. He saw through the eyes of Needham and others that China would return. Why do I use the word return? Is because for 18 of the previous 20 centuries, China had been the largest economy of the world. China's science and civilization contribution to the uh, scientific discovery is probably as great, if not greater than most. And he felt uh, through his uh, knowledge and understanding of China that it would return to being a leading nation. And that wasn't a fantasy. He was a man who had spent a great deal of time studying and reading and talking to significant people, and he was right. And those who worked with him, and there were many of them, uh, had a similar uh, opinion. And over the next 20, 30, 40 years, China began to return. So that's how he got involved. I told you how he, uh, how he uh, got me to get involved. Uh, and uh, my first work was, um, gosh, this is a story. Um, <coughs> The Chinese commercial office was down in uh, Greenwich. It was a lovely old house and it had a big fireplace. And the, the, the wall of the fireplace was somewhere about there. And my father took me down to a meeting he was having with the then commercial councillor, who didn't speak English. And my father didn't speak Chinese. We had an interpreter who we still know today, who, their interpreter. A uh, few, would you like some tea? How's the family? That kind of stuff. And then this man stood up and took my father by one arm and took him into the fireplace. I watched it. I saw him lean over and whisper into my father's ear. And then they came out of the fireplace and sat down. And a few minutes later, the interpreter stood up, took my father by the arm, took him into the fireplace, whispered in his ear, talked for a few moments, and then they came back and sat down. I thought, well, this is a very mysterious uh, form of Chinese culture. <laughs> and then they reached over and gave my father a piece of paper. He opened it, looked at it, and went, okay, put it in his pocket. A while later, we went out, got into the car, and started to drive back into London. I said, um, Dad, what was that about? And he said, it's confidential. <laughs> I said, but you walked into the fireplace with a man who can't speak English, and you can't speak Chinese. What, what was it all about? I said, well, the interpreter interpreted it for me. So what was it about? He said, well, I suppose I better tell you. He said, what they were telling me was what I already had a pretty good inkling about, 
which is that Nixon's going to China. And um, that they want to start off the relationship very quickly with some major purchases from America. And they want me, or us, to um, put those purchases in place so that as soon as Nixon's been to China, real business can be done. I said in the paper, he said the paper was the three commodities they wanted me to find. Polyester, cotton, and uh, uh, an agricultural uh, pesticide, or seven. And uh, I said, oh, I said, that's very interesting. Are you going to America? He said, no, you are. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where a lot of my work time was spent, um, developing those first sales from America to China, continuing business from America to China. I ended up running the business because the directors knew the only person he would hand over responsibility to was me. And they were very kind and very patient with me, teaching me how to do the business. I've done lots of different business in China. If there's any questions on that, I'm happy to explain what I've done and how I've done it. Uh, I did the first big joint venture in China. I did the first big joint venture in America with Chinese uh, partners. I've seen a lot. Uh, and what fascinated me the whole way through was, was what was motivating China and how could I do things which w people were not then doing? How could I understand where China was going? And so if there's one thing I want to share with you, and perhaps it comes back to your question of your 10-year mission, is what do I think are the big important issues of China going forward? And I think there are three I would talk about. You may have others you want to ask questions about. I could talk about anything. I'm like a lawyer. I can talk for as long as people will pay me. Actually, I'm not being paid. But, uh, <laughs> um, First thing I'd, I think I'd like to talk about is, I mean, everybody knows about the incredible transformation of China from being one of the poorest countries in the world to being an economy almost the size of the United States, some say bigger, some say smaller, um, but it's, it, it's the largest trading country in the world. It's got bigger reserves than anybody else in the world. Incredible transformation of China. That was what my father saw. What I see is the transformation of the world through the influence of China. And in that context, there are three things I want to talk about. BRI, the New Silk Roads, uh, the effect of China on Africa, and the third thing, to try and make some uh, introduction to the concept of socialism with Chinese characteristics, because that is what will shape uh, the future of China over the next 30, 40, 50, 60, 100, 125 years. Uh, first of all, the New Silk Roads. I'm going to take it that everybody knows something about the Silk Roads. They go back hundreds of years. They're the movements from maybe North Africa, through Spain, Portugal, through Europe, uh, across uh, Central Asia to, uh, to China, from Muslims to Buddhists, uh, to all sorts of religions that moved across it, all sorts of trade that moved across it. Uh, people would, here would have, may have sat at talks where people talked about the major means of transporting goods across the Silk Roads was camel trains. And uh, my, uh, fr my good friend, Peter Nolan, who is the leading academic on China in the world, Professor Peter Nolan in Cambridge, I was talking to him once about, the, the reason we're friends is we both support the Arsenal, otherwise <laughs> I don't think he can spend any time with me. <laughs> it's brilliant. Um, but Peter was talking to me about um, the Silk Roads, and he said, uh, I said to him, Peter, these camels, I mean, you know, it's incredible to think of these camels carrying everything backwards and forwards. Uh, I mean, I was thinking of, he said, how many camels do you think were involved in a camel train? I said, I don't know, 10, 12, 20? He said they were 1,500, 2,000, 2,500 camels in a camel train. That was the scale of what was moving backwards and forwards. And you think of Marco Polo and his visits and the diaries, and the visits out to Asia and the return of uh, pasta to Italy, just the incredible transformatory events that went on without the hand of governments in it. It was the movement of goods uh, between East and West. And uh, Xi Jinping talked in 2013 in Kazakhstan about the rebuilding of the Silk Roads. Uh, the Chinese call it, in not the most romantic terminology, One Belt, One Road, now called Belt and Road Initiative. But what it is, is that here we live in a world where goods have been shipped from east to west on the sea. Goods are now going to be shipped from east to west across land. 
uh, Central Asia is going to be opened up. Over the next 10, 15 years, uh, the infrastructure has been put in place. It's already been put in place substantially in places like Pakistan and Indonesia. The rail, the rail lines are already running from China right the way across uh, Central Asia through to Europe. But the big transformations, the high-speed trains, the high-speed energy, the high-speed telecommunications that's going to occur, it's all planned for. It's, the funding is, uh, is, is organized. We will see six routes of high-speed trains. Um, there'll be the northern routes through Mongolia and Russia, the southern routes through Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Iran, and Turkey into Europe. But already a lot of those train lines are running across all those areas, taking goods from east to west, more than from west to east. The Silk Roads will be the biggest single investment in infrastructure and creation of cities and towns that has occurred anywhere in the world in its history. Uh, trillions of dollars will be spent over the next 50 years. It is beyond China's capability to fund and organize it all. China will require a great deal of support um, from other countries. The UK took the lead through the uh, decision of George Osborne to go into AIIB. We're in a good position in the UK to participate in the new Silk Roads in many different ways. We also have a lot of goodwill from uh, many countries along the Silk Roads. Some of them are Commonwealth members. And the opportunity for people to get on a train in London and end up in Peking or Beijing or uh, Moscow to Beijing, whichever route they want to take, south or north, in a matter of days, two or three days. Uh, it'll be able to go from Beijing to Moscow in two days within about five years, seven years, something like that. The, the transformation for young people is beyond our imagination. I would say <coughs> that an area of Central Asia that now constitutes 75 million people will probably be an area which will rise to three, four, five hundred million people over the next 30, 40 years. This is an area where the West, stuck without growth, can look to rebuild its own growth dynamic by working with China on the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, there are lots of issues that arise, geopolitical issues, security issues, uh, practical issues, uh, good uh, risk issues. One thing I've learned with China is they don't start something they haven't thought through. So a lot of the issues that people are concerned about, the Chinese have planned for and prepared for. And the one message I would say to the Confucius Institutes is try to work out how to convey to your children, or young people, what the Silk Roads are, where they are, and in what form they're going to change. And if you have a little bit more opportunity, take them along the Silk Roads. Because the Silk Roads that you see today are not the Silk Roads that you'll see in 20, 30, 40, 50 years time. And there are ways of organizing trips along the Silk Road, <coughs> and you don't have to think, well, how are we going to go from Venice, which was one of the beginning places, to uh, Xinjiang in Western China or into, into Beijing. You can do bits over different years, take different parts of it, get different flavors of it. But there is such a wonderful mix of cultures, histories, civilizations, and uh, opportunities that are, that are going to be mixed up in this to give the young people an opportunity of a flavor of it ahead of time is, I think, possibly one of the uh, missions of the Confucius Institutes of China. <coughs> and all over the country now, <laughs> after talking to empty rooms about BRI, uh, Oxford has formed a BRI Institute, Cambridge has formed the BRI Institute. I don't think the people running them know very much about it, but it, it's an indication the people are taking it seriously, the people are studying it, they want to know and uh, come to terms with what is this incredible transformation of the, of the, um, of the world that's going to occur. Uh, and, and there is also, as part of it, a transformation of sea routes along, right along to Africa, which brings me to the second part, which is the opportunities of, uh, of Africa. Um, there's a very good book called The Prisoners of Geography, I think. It's called by a chap called Tim Marshall. I don't know whether any of you have had a chance to read it. He is, um, I think, the diplomatic editor. The reason I'm doing this is so I can make sure I don't talk too much. Tell me, 
but I've got 10 minutes to go. Um, Tim Marshall is, uh, I think, the diplomatic editor or the news editor of ITN, something like that. And he's written a book called Prisoners of Geography. It's a very good book to read because it shows how much of the geopolitics of the world today are formed by the geography of the world. And he, he identifies that with regard to Africa and uh, South America, which were both colonized by the Europeans, uh, that the colonists really landed uh, in the sea, by the sea of course, and then moved inland to take the resources that they wanted. So all the infrastructure of transportation in South America, which I'm not going to go into further for the time being, and Africa, is from the coast inland. There is little in the way of communication within Africa. And that is what China is putting in place, an infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, to enable Africa to be able to move about. So if you want to go from Nigeria to Uganda, you almost have to fly to Europe to go to Uganda. It's, it's all the infrastructure of transportation is being worked on by China, country by country. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, it's not simple, but you know, the Ch Chinese put in the Tanzania-Zambian railway in 1976, 77, something like that. So they have some idea of what it's like to operate in Africa. And uh, I'm quite sure that this transportation infrastructure will be put in place. But that's not, that's not the, the core of, 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 of this whole thing. The core of what I want to say is the African opportunity is Africa is about a billion people, just short of a billion people, I think. I think something like 60 or 70 percent aged under 25. Um, and it's a country with, it's a continent with great potential. Africa is very likely to have an industrial revolution, and it's very likely that the sponsors of that industrial revolution will be China. Now, why do I say that? I'll give you an example. Africa at the moment exports, Africa produces about 1.8 million tons of cotton. And 95% of that cotton is exported. So that means that the, 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 the people of Africa are growing cotton, they're ginning it, they're taking it to the ports, and it's going off to other countries uh, to be used as raw cotton. <clears throat> the Chinese textile companies are moving into Africa, and they are building the capacity to take that cotton and turn it into garments. So here you've got a world which uh, produces textiles in Asia and ships them to Europe and North America. And I'm quite sure because I'm involved in some of the deals to do this, that Africa will become the main source of textile garments for the world within 15 years or so. And if you look at the history of England, what sparked our industrial revolution was the textile industry. So here you've got the Chinese helping Africa to develop an industrial revolution. And this is uh, the second area where I think we as a country need to again look at the opportunities that are going to occur. Because whilst the Chinese may try and take advantage of a lot of the things that they're creating here, uh, many of these countries are Commonwealth members, many of these countries feel comfortable despite our, our, our complicated histories Many of them feel comfortable with the British way of doing things. And if you go to Africa, and I've spent a bit of time working with this subject, you'll find that the British colonies, former British colonies, have quite a good relationship with the British. And what surprised me was um, that the Chinese uh, um, operation in Africa is organized around something called the China Africa Fund, which is underneath the China Development Bank, and that's the funding source for a lot of the Chinese developments in Africa. And uh, I've got to know the chairman reasonably well. Um, we, we, we got on okay about uh, some deals that did work and some deals that didn't work. Uh, we kind of got to trust each other. And one day he said to me, I'm finding things difficult, Stephen, which was very unusual for a Chinese to call me by my first name, <laughs> secondly to admit to difficulties, and third to expect a foreigner to help. So I said to him, what's, what's the problem? He said, well, I've been told that the only way I'm going to get more funds for investment in Africa is by selling the investments that we, owe, that we have in Africa. He said, I didn't choose any of these investments. 
I was told to make these investments by various ministries through the banks. And when we made those investments in Africa, we never for a moment thought about exit routes. He said, and I have got to work out how to sell many of our investments in Africa in order to, um, uh, to create the funds for new investment. And so we had a chat about what that meant and I introduced him to some people I knew who were probably more capable than, than me of helping him uh, transform business situations into offerings and, and so on and so forth. And I said to him, well, what are you going to do? And what is it that they were going to do was invest in transforming African resources into finished goods. That's jobs for people. So if you come back to that textile example, if they transform the cotton into garments, it's at least 100,000 jobs. That's a phenomenal number in Africa today. So you just think of the wealth that's coming in uh, that, 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 that that represents and the opportunities. Somebody's gonna build a polyester plant, that's hundreds of millions of dollars of investment, and that will turn the textile production from 1.9 million tons probably into five or seven million tons. So the Chinese are boosting a lot of this African development and it presents a lot of great opportunities for British companies and British people to participate in. So uh, if I've got enough time to just deal with socialism with Chinese characteristics. Because what is it that's mobilizing the Chinese the whole time? Understand the vision and you can understand the parts of it that are going on. What is the 19th Party Congress uh, in about three weeks time? What does it represent? It represents the transformation from China as a feudal society in 1949. 90% of the population uh, were peasants. In 2017, it's probably down to about 35% of the population are from the countryside. But they're moving from being peasants to being agricultural workers. So we're having a country that's moving from being 90% peasants to being about 10 to 15% uh, working in the rural areas, 10 to 15 percent in manufacturing, and about another 60, 65 percent in the services industry. It is the transformation of this country. Why, where are they going to? What are they trying to do? And the answer is they're trying to produce their economy to becoming an economy which is a high income economy, probably by about 2030, 2035. But socialism with Chinese characteristics is the goal. And uh, Deng Xiaoping said by uh, 2049, I think Xi Jinping has put his foot on the accelerator to put a lot of that in place by 2021. These are the two centenary goals. 2021 is the 100 years since the founding of the Communist Party of China. 2049, 100 years since the founding of China. Socialism, simplest explanation that I can give for that is about the sharing of the wealth of the nation. If you take the Gini coefficient as the measure by which the, um, you, you measure the sharing of the wealth, uh, China is above five, Britain and America about four, Germany about 3.5, and Denmark about 2.5. China is on a journey from over five to 2.5. We live in capitalist market economies. The Chinese are building a socialist market economy. Our, our market economy depends upon businesses making things happen. The Chinese are encouraging businesses to make it happen, but it will be the party and the state that will sit over it, plan it, and make sure that it's staying within the, the objectives that they have for 100 years that were being set, unbeknown to me, in 1978. Chinese characteristics, what, is the, what does that mean? Anybody here from China will know that the ways of China are very different from the ways of Britain. The Chinese um, have had hundreds of years, there is some uh, dispute about what I'm about to say, but for hundreds of years, China has prospered when the officials of China have been um, committed to the people of China, to delivering uh, prosperity and stability <coughs> to the people of China. This is what Xi Jinping and the others are doing now with the anti-corruption uh, moves. They're trying to turn the officials into being people who will deliver for the people of China. This is drawing on the history and civilization of China going back 2,000, 2000 years. 
if you want to understand the thinking in Xi Jinping's mind and in other Chinese, you have to understand something about the old Chinese sages of Confucius and other people of the times. Socialism with Chinese characteristics takes as much from Chinese history and civilization as it does from Marxism. And it's an incredible blend of the two. There are some in China who think that, uh, that the target is possibly unrealizable, that the greed that's inherent in the market economy will drive China in a different direction, or that the market economy needs to be allowed to be more capitalist than socialist. We understand some of those arguments, but I think that uh, what they're trying to do in China today is to say to the big companies, you can be prosperous, you can make a lot of money, but it'll be within the confines of what we as a party think is the right thing for China. So there's lots of years of struggle ahead between the different courses that this contains. Uh, for those who think that China may fail, I say, just look at what's happened in the last 37 years. Don't bet against China. When the 19th Party Congress happened on October the 18th, when all the statements start coming out, you bet your bottom dollar that the sorts of things that are written in today's Financial Times by a lady I know reasonably well, but I can't remember her name, who is writing about um, the reform of the state-owned enterprises, giving the example of Unicom being wrong. I just want to say to her, who do you think you're betting against? You're betting against people who anticipated all this a long time ago. Sure, they make mistakes. Sure, things go wrong. And sure, they change their, their line. But in general, the progress of China over 38 years is phenomenal. And I wouldn't <coughs> bet against China. So when you read those headlines in um, about three weeks' time, think China, okay, but there are these big problems that they haven't thought about. They thought about them. Uh, but a lot of them you're not going to be able to deal with until they come at you, and then you're going to deal with them effectively. So as I bring to the end my comments and my introduction, uh, I hope I've helped illuminate some of the subjects that uh, you invited me here to speak about. And if you have any questions, I'll try and remember the answers. Thank you very much. <laughs> Stephen, thank you.